unfortunate and when he's early it's a catastrophe so um, thank you for helping us avoid a catastrophe this morning sir um, we appreciate it uh, DC traffic has worked its will on the scheduling of our event so we apologize for being a little bit uh, late in getting started but um, John Paxton has graciously agreed to stay stick around for a few minutes longer so hopefully we'll be able to have a full hour-long conversation um, thank you all very much for coming out this morning we uh, are very honored to have General Paxton here with us. He flew all night long to, to, to keep this commitment, so we're especially grateful for the heroic sacrifices he's made to be here. Um, it, it coincides with the release of our recent report. Um, I think some copies of this were available. It's also available on our website, Amphibious Shipping Shortfalls, um, Risks and Opportunities to Bridge the Gap. So we undertook that analysis with the support of Huntington Ingalls Industries, who um, for whom we had done some work a few years ago on the contributions of amphibious ships to um, sort of low-end missions. And they asked us to do some follow-on work to look at, um, at, at sort of the contributions that amphibious ships and other ships might make to across the full range of missions. So um, we undertook this analysis. Um, I, I think we had to start with the, the reality that General Paxton is faced to confront every day, that there's a serious, <laughs> a, a serious gap between uh, what the Marine Corps is being asked to do and the resources that they have available to do it, not uh, only because of sequestration. This is a problem that has been developing uh, over a decade or more, um, both on the supply side and the demand side. And, and I think um, while innovation is the word of the day, the Marine Corps has been forced by circumstances to innovate um, in lots of ways to respond to that gap over the past few years in particular. And so um, I, I think we were really trying to look at some of that and in particular the opportunities available to leverage other non-traditional platforms to try to accomplish some of the missions um, that the Marine Corps is being asked to do um, and and attempted to lay out a framework for how some of the decisions about where the investments are made to better leverage the entire fleet, uh, amphibious MSC uh, and otherwise, might be uh, most efficient and most effective. So again, um, I'm sure that'll be part of the conversation that we have today, but don't want to restrict it to that. Uh, that we could spend days and days talking about all the challenges facing the Marine Corps and, and their chart for the future. Um, no one better suited to have that conversation with than General Paxton, um, who has commanded and served in, um, I think, probably three quarters of the globe, approximately, is my, been, been, or been responsible for in some capacity. Um, so, and commanded at every level inside the Marine Corps uh, and served in multiple uh, critical positions outside the Corps, both in the Joint Force and elsewhere. And so, um, and now, coming up on his two-year anniversary as the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, has been living the day-to-day -day challenges, not only of trying to um, address current demands, but of helping to set the chart, chart the course for the future, um, and, and determine, make, make very difficult decisions about where the Corps is headed. So, um, Sir, again, we're very grateful to you for coming. I'll, I'll ask him to make a couple of remarks. Um, I'll pose a few questions and then really want to open it up for a conversation with you all. Um, when we get to the Q&A period, first, if people could turn off ringers, that would be much appreciated. And then um, when we get to the Q&A period, if you would just raise your hand. We have a couple people with mics who will come around and um, give them to you. If you could identify yourself and, and briefly ask your question, it would be much appreciated. So with that, sir. Thank you, you, Dr. Lee. Uh, it's great to be with everyone. My apologies. Could not, Mark Twain and uh, John Wayne both said never start with an apology, but I regret that the traffic didn't cooperate this morning. Uh, delighted to be with you, and if indeed, if we do have a few extra minutes, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer uh, if the question and answer period is going well. As I look out at the audience, I see uh, some familiar faces from around the town, either from think tanks, from industry, from the Navy Marine team, from allied partners. Uh, so I know we have an interested and an active group here. And for Dr. Lee and CSIS, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with the audience, as well as for the great efforts that the team did to put together the study on amphibious shipping. 
Uh, we do suffer uh, sometimes in the building from being focused on the crisis of the immediate, and whenever we get folks from outside that force us to pick up our site picture and open our aperture a little bit, it's helpful just to see where the sense of the broader population, the sense of the broader community is, and how it's asking us to maybe take a look at some difficult challenges. Uh, I would start just with, a, if you will, a little bit of context and leveling on the playing field. So I'd like to talk a little bit about who we are, where we are, and then either where we are going and how that compares to where we have been. And I want to do it just for a couple minutes just so you may get a sense, either on the Marine Corps or on the Navy Marine team, uh, how we look at amphibious shipping. So first issue, of course, is uh, the missions, the day-to-day -day missions that we actually have to accomplish around the world, and then the, uh, the military personnel and the military equipment and resources that we have available to us to accomplish the mission. So no surprise to anyone that before 9-11, uh, uh, we were in the 180s. Uh, we had envisioned ourselves for the better part of four decades to be the nation's 911 force pre 9 11. Uh, and that is still what the Marine Corps truly thinks we are all about. Since the National, Secure, uh, National Defense Authorization Act in 1952, we are chartered to be most ready when the nation is least ready. Uh, we have articulated that message in two mindsets uh, complementary, uh, sometimes a little friction, but very, very complementary to the Marine Corps. The first one is it has to be naval. It's not Marine, it's naval. We're a part of the Department of the Navy. It's an integrated mission set, it's a complementary mission set, and we can't do what we need to do without uh, our shipmates in the Navy. And then the second piece is it's expeditionary, that we're gonna go with places where the rest of the nation is not normally going to go, where there's a lack of infrastructure, where we're gonna have to project power, we're going to need some sovereign launch and recovery space, and we may have to operate for a sustained period of time without many other resources, which would mean you have to fly them back and forth off, on and off the ship, and we're going to need the ability to, as I said, not only to launch and recover people in power, but also the things that we need to sustain us, whether it's command and control, logistics, whatever that is. Uh, so that's where we were since 1952, certainly since uh, 1991. Uh, when we had uh, a major revision on the amphibious structure and the way the Navy Marine team looked at amphibious platforms. And then again in 2006 and 2007, when it was a reminder to us that despite the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we needed to stay focused on our primary mission. And indeed, if many of you will remember, we were still launching and recovering MUSE and expeditionary units in and out of both of those theaters from naval shipping. Uh, in particular, when we did the pivot back in 09-10, uh, and we looked to kind of move some of the folks back into Afghanistan. We took 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines off the baton and moved them into theater with their equipment, with the uh, amphibious, uh, uh, with the uh, helicopters and the, and the lift that they needed. So I give this to you because we've been 13 and a half years in the war in Afghanistan, and we were almost nine years in Iraq. So there was a, a focus on land operations, but that never took the eyes of the Navy Marine team off amphibious operations and off expeditionary operations. Uh, point number two, uh, if I may, is that uh, inside the Navy, and this is just a statement of fact, so I'm not casting any aspersions here, uh, the Navy has a wonderful, first off, the Navy has great capital investment challenges. They have great capital investment opportunities, but they have great capital investment challenges because they are capital resource intensive in a way that the Marine Corps is not. Uh, so we are keenly aware on the green side of what our shipmates on the blue side have to deal with in terms of investments. I, I would submit to the audience that the Navy has long had a very robust and detailed plan for how they want to both modernize and maintain their submarines and how they want to modernize and maintain their carriers and to another sense, between the blue and the green side, how we're going to modernize and maintain our aircraft. We have not always been that dedicated and that good on how we're going to modernize and maintain our amphibious shipping, and that means the totality of that construct. It's the ship, the aircraft that go ship to shore, the landing craft that go ship to shore, and the connectors that go ship to shore. And this is not for lack of intellect. It's not for lack of effort. It's just for lack of continued, consistent focus because we get pulled in different directions. We have reorganizations on the green side and the blue side. Uh, we need to be good. We have a naval board. We have a Navy Marine team. And we do very well when we sit down at the table. But we have to force ourselves to sit down at the table. And many times it takes a crisis or a equipment malfunction or 
a piece of equipment that didn't deliver on time and on target and on cost that forced us to go back in and relook at these things. So we are subject to uh, the issues of construction in the shipyards. We're subject to the challenges that happen around the world that pull us in different directions. And we have learned a lot over the last probably 18, 19, 20 years about how to do this better, but it still requires a lot of focus. So I would say I think that the Navy Marine team is committed to continue to work together. And uh, if you allow the words of Winston Churchill when, hey, we're out of money, we have to think. And that's where we're at right now. We're, we're out of money, and we're going to have to think. Uh, Point number next, on the, on the mission sets themselves. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't remind that in the Marines, at least in, in specific, we all are always going to focus on the most dangerous enemy course of action. Not necessarily the most likely enemy course of action, but the most dangerous course of action. And we're going to try and hold ourselves as a service, our department, and our institution liable for, or responsible rather, for helping us produce people, equipment, training, and readiness that can handle the most dangerous course of action. We believe that the most likely will be some type of subset from the most dangerous. But we're going to focus on the most dangerous. So we're going to keep ringing that clarion bell for why we need more ships and why we need more ships available. And those are two key points that were in the good study that CSIS did, which is you have to tackle the challenge of amphibious lift and amphibious power projection through the lens of both inventory and availability. And we have challenges on both of them. We knew the better part of 10 years ago that we were going to be in this kind of dynamic. As you can see, the growing national debt, you can see when the national debt was going to be due. And as Dr. Leeds said, again, this was long before sequestration hit the table. And sequestration has just magnified the problem. So when the buying power and the purchasing power of uh, the Navy Marine team and indeed all the services, somewhere between uh, 9 and 14 percent less per year and forecasted to remain that way for the next 10 years. We're going to have some significant challenges here. We also know that people are our most valuable and most precious, but also our most expensive resource. Uh, two of the services, the Navy and the Air Force, spend a lot on, on hardware, but the Army and the Marine Corps are going to continue to spend a high percentage of their dollar on people. In the Marine Corps, it's almost 62 percent. Now, we think that's the right investment. That's our most lethal weapon system, and we're going to continue to seek out, recruit, train, retain high-quality individuals. Uh, but we're going to go then go back to the Navy, to our shipmates, and ask them to make a comparable investment in the piece of that weapon system that helps the Marine do his mission, which for us is the amphib ship. So I, I tell you that only because, again, we know that uh, there is a national requirement, and you've seen the debate when the budget comes due, how many carriers we have to keep underway and on the waterfront. Uh, we know that we have to modernize our, our aircraft fleet. We're going to bring in the uh, F-35, the, the JSF. Uh, we can see where the bathtub is going between Virginia and Ohio class submarines and the, and the great challenge that the Navy has there. But somewhere in the middle of all that construct, we have to get back and build more amphibious ships. Uh, 38 is the number that we have operationally agreed to, uh, to support two operations plans in two different geographic combatant commander area responsibilities and to do the assault echelon power projection of two MEBs. So that's the most stressing, most dangerous case that I talked about a few minutes ago. There's an equal dynamic that in today's unstable world, it doesn't matter whether you call it the new norm or uh, steady state instability, but when you look at what happened several years ago simultaneously in Sana'a, Yemen, uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Libya, all around the littorals there in the Eastern Red and North Africa, at the same time, we were trying to keep presence in the Gulf to project uh, what we couldn't do either in Iraq or, or elsewhere from Kuwait and on, on board the ship. At the same time, we're looking at piracy in the Somalia Basin. So there's, there's an argument that in many cases, the steady state environment is the most pressing as well. And if you have seven marine expeditionary units, seven MUs that you're going to deploy around the world, and it takes three to make one. So you have three that are out, the 31st MU out in Western Pacific, you have an East Coast MU and a West Coast MU, and then arguably you have one that just came back and one that's going out again. So how you work the availability of the Marines on a one to two dwell, how you work the availability of the ships and the FRP, whether it was a 737 or an OFRP mix there, or 727 rather, or an OFRP mix, is a challenge how you synchronize those schedules. And then in the final analysis, the Navy always gets a vote. Uh, I spent three years almost down at, at Second Marine Expeditionary Force prior to coming up to the building, and I believe we sent out five consecutive MUSE, and everyone went early and everyone stayed, stayed late. They never went out on the scheduled time, 
and they never stayed for seven months. One of them stayed for 10 and a half months, set a, set a record, if that's a record you want to set. Uh, but the challenge is we have to respond to the crisis around the world, and there's not really an appetite to say no, because they know that the Swiss Army knife, if you will, or the weapon of choice is this Navy Marine team, this ARGMU that has to go out there. So how you continue to answer the bell for the crisis that happened around the world, whether it's Benghazi or Cairo or Sana'a or Somalia, how you then husband your resources so you can get them into the maintenance that the ships absolutely need and still be ready for this stressing straight op plan is the challenge that we have. So any of these arguments that we have either inside the building, separate and distinct from the budget on an operational and a strategic side, and the studies that CSI has to help us get to where we need to go in terms of looking at this problem. So let me address quickly two other things and then turn it over to Dr. Lee for any questions she has and then open it up to the broader audience. Uh, one of the discussions that was highlighted in the study that we continue to look at is the availability of alternative platforms. Uh, and I will tell you that alternative platforms are just that. They are alternative platforms. So we are more, most willing to look at them. But they bring with them not only a sense of opportunity, which we should always seize in the short term, particularly when we have crisis missions that we have to respond to, but we should always be wary of the risk that we entertain when we bring in an alternative platform. Some of the alternative platforms are not near as uh, advantageous as they would offer themselves to be, either because of the sea state they can work in, the degree of survivability they have, or for us, and I know the study looked at five different attributes of amphibious shipping, but within the five different attributes, on the projection attribute in the study, we look at five fingerprints of lift. And these are steady state, constant requirements for the Navy Marine team. And it's people, uh, small craft, so well deck spots, air aircraft, flight deck spots, square feet for, for vehicles and stow, and cubic feet for supply. So we're going to look at those five fingerprints of lift, regardless of what the ship mix is, regardless of what the mission is. And then we also have to look at the ability of that platform to have an integrated command and control capability. The Navy is going to rightfully so look at command and control within the task force or the task element. They're going to look at links for naval aircraft. But we're going to look at it for links into the joint force, links from ship to shore, and some command and control and communications capabilities that are not always put into the design of the ship. We get much, much better at that. Things like the New York class and the new uh, LPD is a state-of-the-art ship that we're incredibly proud of. And it, it can answer the five fingerprints of lift. It can answer the command and control capability. Uh, but how you build that resident ca capability and capacity in each ship is really important to us. Uh, so I guess on that note, I probably uh, spoke long enough. Hopefully that's kind of set the stage for everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thanks for the great work to kind of tee up the discussion, which is incredibly important. And I think to everyone here, the Navy Marine team is committed to do with or without the sequestration that we're going to face. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, let me build off your closing remarks, if I could, and, and say I, I think the biggest macro takeaway from our work was that, um, that you, the Navy Marine Corps leadership, are, frequent, are constantly being forced with trade-offs across the entire uh, very complex system that results in amphibious capability from not just the ships, the connectors, the, the lift fingerprints, which are also changing, and, um, and the force that, that uses all that equipment. So, and that there is not a, 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 a good system for understanding the system-wide effects of trades within those piece parts, necessarily. So um, often, we, it, it appeared, at least to us, that, that decisions are, are made within the components of those yeah. without understanding the broader implications, necessarily, and that there can be pretty significant changes in capability that uh, may not be understood right. when individual decisions are made. So I, A, I wanted to see if you share that assessment, and, and B, is, if so, is there something needed that would allow you all to better understand the system dynamics um, so that you could manage it more holistically, or is that just the nature of the beast? Yes, so to your first question, Dr. Lead, uh, it is a fair assessment. We do make, and not maliciously, uh, not always accidentally, but we do make some decisions uh, that are forced on the exigencies of the time, and a lot of them are fiscal, 
that we'll, we will try to optimize the decision, but we will sub-optimize the process. Uh, and this is just a fact of life, which gets to your second point. Uh, the challenge for us will be that we're going to continue to live in this environment in the short term, and we are at greater risk for making suboptimal decision, uh, optimal decisions in the short term that will be suboptimal in the long term, which is why things like the Navy Marine Board need to be a continuous drumbeat to get the Navy Marine team together, why we are actively looking within the department to make decisions for the amphibious enterprise akin to some of the large-scale decisions they make on the aviation enterprise or the submarine enterprise. And we need to be better at that, steady at that, uh, to make sure that it, in the MU, ARG MU days, if you get a Navy Marine team out there, normally the questions they will ask themselves is, what do I know, who have I told, and who else needs to know? In the building, we are at risk, particularly when you have a fast turn and you have a lot of uh, fiscal marks of not remembering to tell everybody, and then you get a decision that you think you made for the right reason, but it's just on the green side and not on the blue side, or just on the blue side, not on the green side, or just in the aviation piece of it and not on the surface piece, and then you sub-optimize the decision. And again, it's not out of malice. It's invariably driven by the fiscal environment, uh, but knowing that we're going to be in this fiscal environment for the next seven to ten years, and with a reasonable expectation that sequestration will kick in, and there'll be that $552 billion debt and that 10% less buying power for a year. We have to get better about talking across the table, and maybe not rushing to a decision. And we also have to, in all fairness, go back and take a look at both our industry partners who make these and our congressional leadership to say, what other options do we have here? When we took, take a look at about multi-year and split increment and, and w what are the triggers to allow you to start to fund a ship, and how long you can continue that with a reasonable expectation that it will still deliver on time, on target, and on cost. These are things that we have to continue to work together. Okay. Um, let me switch gears a little bit and ask you about uh, Expeditionary Force 21. And from your perspective, what you see as the most important elements of that strategy, and then where you think it needs to continue to be fleshed out going forward. Right. Uh, Expeditionary Force 21 uh, is indeed a, a blue-green strategy. It was worked between the two departments. Uh, it was an effort to take a look at uh, the unstable, steady-state world that we're uh, looking at in the future and the new norm. It was an effort to take a look at where uh, some of the advanced capabilities are, both in amphibious shipping and in uh, maritime preposition shipping and uh, uh, black bottom and gray bottom alike, and, and take a look at uh, where the challenge could be around the world, uh, what kind of capability sets we need, and how as a blue-green team we would look to answer uh, those mission sets. So it is a, st a first step, uh, just as we did from the sea and forward from the sea. So the first thing is it's a clarion call that it is a Navy Marine team, it isn't an amphibious world, it's an expeditionary world, and we want to go back and focus on that. So it was a conscious decision within the service and within the department to say, hey, look, we're getting away from Iraq and Afghanistan, not that we can't go back there, not that those kind of sustained ground wars couldn't happen again, but we have to still be the nation's 911 force. It's a maritime nation, you know, uh, and God bless, uh, you know, we maintain a Navy, we raise an Army, but we maintain a Navy, so we're looking in the business of how we maintain that Navy and that naval uh, capability. So this was a call to start to think about that again and to kind of set a baseline template and a foundation from which we could continue to adjust in the years ahead. Um, one final question, um, it's, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but it, it's interesting to me that while our amphibious capability is certainly under strain and arguably um, declining to some degree, much of the rest of the world is, is starting to invest much more heavily in their amphibious capabilities. And so um, as the Marine Corps looks both to uh, better leverage existing other, other ships across the U.S. fleet, what kinds of opportunities do you see for uh, increasing combined operations with the growing amphibious capabilities of many of our partners? Yeah, I mean, we are living in a, a joint world, an interagency world, uh, an allied and coalition partner world. So uh, whether you look at advanced capabilities that the United Kingdom has, that uh, France has, uh, that perhaps Spain and Italy are looking at, and then you certainly look at where Australia may want to go, and then you look at potential enemies out there and what they're investing in amphibious fleet too. And there's a marker there that 
uh, most allied partners and nations and a lot of the enemy realize that there is true uh, amphibious value, true war fighting value, and a necessity to invest in amphibious shipping. So you have sovereign turf from which you can launch and recover power, from which you can do contain, uh, sustained command and control and sustained support ashore. So it's, it's a message there that it is important that we did have it right and we need to continue to get it right. Okay, let me open it up to all of you. Again, if you could uh, briefly state your name and, and question. If we'll go up here and get, get, if we can pre-position the mics if other people have questions. Stun them into silence, except for Sydney. Yeah, exactly. I'm shocked. <laughs> yes, I know. I know you were trying to avoid giving me the first one, but here I am. I had no options. Uh, reporters, we don't die; we multiply. Sydney Friedberg, BreakingDefense.com. One thing that you know popped out at me from the study and other places, and that you know you wrestled a bit with your comments is to what degree from the size of the fleet, the amphibious fleet, and all those other pieces, connectors, and so forth, to go with it. To what extent the stressing case is still, you know, that two MEB, uh, two major theater war scenario, and to what extent the, st the quote unquote new normal is actually pulling you in so many different directions that that really has to be the forcing function. You know, that's not a matter just of, of how you size, but what you size for, and certainly with these different survivability levels of ships, may suggest that some things which were previously considered not useful uh, or not as useful may actually have more application. Yes. Uh, so understand the question, Sydney. Uh, I'm going to try and answer it, and I, I agree with your first part, but disagree with your second part. So we do have to balance uh, the, the dual stressors of a multi-op plan near simultaneous or the simultaneity of major theater operations, as well as the steady state. Uh, disorder out in the world and how we respond to that with crisis response, contingency, and presence. Uh, I think the report did a very good job about looking historically where the department has been and where those numbers are and where testimony from the service chiefs and the service uh, deputies who do amphibious ops have been. Uh, as I said in prepared comments here a minute ago, 38 is the number that we have agreed to since 1991 as the as a steady state dual operation plan requirement. Uh, and there is argument and both CNO and Commandant are on record as saying in the steady state with the disorder around the world, the, the number could easily be somewhere between 48 and 54, low, high 40s, low, low 50s. And, and that's designed or based on the premise that, again, you need three to make one, which is the, always the Navy Marine construct. You have a unit that's out deployed. You just brought a, sim a similar unit back, and you're going to get ready to train and send out another unit. The report was good about highlighting, for example, the fact that because of the current paucity of shipping, uh, that we have a lot of units that in order to get the ships and the aircraft, and so it's not just shipping into the maintenance cycle, that you have a unit that's getting ready to deploy and will train on one set of ships and with one set of aircraft, and then they will do their certifications and actually deploy on another ship and with another set of aircraft, which is another example of being suboptimal because it just destroys the concept of cohesion. It, des it destroys the ability to have you uh, wrestle with and get those lessons learned so the unit you're going to train with is the actual unit you deployed with. So the answer to your second part is uh, I believe that the uh, most likely and the daily crisis response contingency is still a subset of the most dangerous. I have not seen in the time I've been in uh, an indication where there was some unique capability on an amphib ship that we needed to have for contingency response and crisis response and day to day that wasn't subsumed in that larger set of major theater operation. I just needed that ship to be available and want to make sure that the uh, the chief of boat and the sergeant major had worked with each other, that the uh, lead petty officer who was doing the well deck and doing the launch and recovery and the gunny who was splashing the tracks, I wanted to make sure that they had gone through the right workup together and that they indeed had trained together and were going to deploy together. So having sufficient ships uh, pre or, or, uh, home ported in the right places and available to train and deploy is, is the critical piece. So uh, we, have to, we can balance capacity and capability, but we just need, we need more. We need more inventory and we need better availability, as the report said. Um, I just want to add one thing because uh, one of the things that I learned over the course of conducting the study was the 38 number is, is utilized frequently, um, but it, as an example of what I was 
talking about earlier, the 38 number also included an assumption that the right. maritime prepositioning force future Bingo. was right. going to deliver a certain set, set of capabilities, which was subsequently significantly right. downgraded, which I, I, I think, I don't want to second guess what past commandants might have done, but um, that lack of, of clear transparency about when you make changes to what MPFF might look like, hey, it, it affects Absolutely. the number of amphibs you might need, um, is something that sort of got lost in the shuffle. And so we still use the 38 number, although the premise upon which it based, was based changed somewhat. And, that, and again, that's the sort of the la lack of systems view that, that I think we found a lot of well, evidence The challenge there, without being flip, is that when you work to come to a short-term fiscal agreement and you get to the end state, there are all the asterisks and caveats down below, and all people understand and agree to is that you bought the house, and they don't see all the caveats, you know, subject to an inspection of the roof, subject to the chimney won't fall off, subject to repair of the sewer, you know, and, and we don't read all the caveats. So when we do these Navy Marine uh, integrated decisions there, it's just subject to uh, quantity, quality, availability of maritime preposition ships, subject to the fact that those MPF ships are going to be preposition in the right places and have the right Cuban square and capability that they have. So and we have to continue to follow through on all the asterisks and carryouts and footnotes. Oh, okay, I think we had a question right here. Hi, Laura Seligman, Inside the Navy. Thank you for being here for today. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the joint high-speed vessel, if you could just elaborate on that. I know it was there was um, some talk about it in the report, um, and the, um, especially I know that Austell has been doing a study where they're trying to certify the V-22 to fly off the JHSV. I was wondering um, if you could talk about how that would enhance the capability of the platform, and particularly for amphibious operations. Right. Thanks very much. A very good question. Uh, joint high-speed vessel, uh, at least two uh, different models there. Uh, very capable and, and a great, as we talked about, a great opportunity that we can use there. Uh, should not delude ourselves in terms of its survivability and should not delude ourselves in terms of the sea state within, it can, within which it can operate. Uh, it is, I think, a splendid platform for building partnership capacity, for theater security cooperation, for humanitarian assistance crisis response. It really doesn't equate, and I don't see how you can legitimately put it into an operations plan for a major theater operation unless you are doing long-term, later, follow-on operations. Nothing to do with the assault echelon or, or the early stages because of the survivability of the ship. It's a classic indication also, when you talk the five fingerprints of lift, that the joint high-speed vessel is very good about the people, about projecting the people, and perhaps some small arms that's with it. Uh, but it is not good about the other fingerprints of lift. It, it, may have some, it may have some square foot. I will give you that, okay? It doesn't necessarily have all the cubic foot, and it certainly doesn't have the what, plate deck spots, weld deck spots. So again, when you look at this, I, again, I go back to the second piece of the five attributes in the study, which is projection, and then I go to the five fingerprints of lift. And I say, what is the mission? What is the risk to mission? And consequently, what does that platform allow us to do to help accomplish those two things. So the joint high-speed vessel certainly has applicability. Putting a, a ramp on the, or to, to be able to splash off the JHSV is something that we're actively looking at right now. So if you were to work on the, the uh, draft of the ship and how you would trade off perhaps Cuban Square for maybe a vehicle that you could get on there and then splash, that's something that probably merits consideration. That would certainly help if we were doing exercises and building partnership capacity in the North African littoral. Uh, you could take a look if we had to do a, a NEO or a casualty evacuation or something like that. And if the threat posture wasn't severe, you may be able to use that high-speed vessel and get it back and forth to a larger ship stationed further out at, at, at anchor or underway or to an island or something like that. Uh, so it has applicability there. Uh, but to take that deliberately in with a mew and to say well, this is what we're going to use for a crisis response in the North Arabian Gulf or to posture it as part of an operations plan in the Pacific, probably not the optimal use of that vessel. I'm sorry. 
Osprey. Oh, the Osprey, no. Uh, I mean, the, when you look right, right now, no. I mean, the Osprey is an incredible aircraft. Uh, tw two to three times the range, two to three times the payload, uh, and two to three times the lift, and can air-to-air -air refuel. And it has proven itself in multiple circumstances and is really one of that fundamental pieces now of the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, but there's really limitations in terms of uh, not only the force and the heat that it generates down, but the wingspan it needs in terms of the deck spot. And I think right now that's incompatible with the JHSB. Thanks. Okay, we'll go over here and then over here. So. Must have touched the hot button. All the uh, hands no, went all up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, John Evans, I'm the Army Fellow at uh, Brookings. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, as we've have we started to see, as, as you kind of acknowledge, that our world is growing increasingly more urban and more coastal with regards to populations and where the friction points are going to be. I know that U.S. Army aviation has kind of reinvested itself in being able to stage and, and project power from uh, naval vessels and platforms. Uh, how, how is the Marine Corps uh, working with the Army on this, since there is obviously a capacity issue here with, uh, with amphibious uh, assault vessels? Yeah, thanks, uh, John. Good question. Uh, First, and let me be clear, you know, we're very conscious inside the Joint Chiefs and very conscious in the building. Uh, one of the inherent risks when the dollars get tighter is that you got five brother, four or five brothers fighting for the same piece of allowance, okay? And then you love your brother, but you're going to punch him in the nose if you can get two extra dollars and make him live on 50 cents. And that's not a healthy way to do business. And because we've all been in war together for the last 13 years, I tell you that the services and the departments are pretty committed that despite the pressures of the budget, we got to talk through this. So just like we want to talk as a Navy Marine team, we want to talk with the Joint Chiefs too, make sure that we have a coherent national strategy of where we want to go, and we've kind of delineated roles and responsibilities. Do I think in some time in the short term there, we, there may be a relook at roles and missions? I, I don't think so, but it would be not unrealistic to say we're going to be challenged to kind of reassert some roles and missions, because we've all been operating in a very small theater and very focused on Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so there will be some folks who say, no, this is what we did 9-11. This is what I think our designated assigned role and mission is in the national security strategy. This is what we're going to do. Uh, could that create, and I'm being brutally honest here, so could that create tension between the Army and the Marine Corps? It could if we let it. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to. Uh, the Army, I know, is looking at regional line forces, regional line brigades. They want to get out and about around the world. As I have said publicly in several other forums, there's a lot of gunfight out there. There's a lot of bad guys out there. There's a lot of missions out there. We ought not to worry about territor territoriality between uh, the, the different services. Uh, when you get to working with the Army, uh, here's, and I'll be honest with you again, here's our mandate to the Navy. We're okay with Army touching and going, provided the Marines touch and go first. Now, it's not because we're most important. It's because we don't have enough time to touch and go. We don't have enough ships out there to do our deck bounces to do our night vision goggle ops. Uh, we don't have enough TCAT shipping, Type Commander's Amphibious Training, to launch and recover our amphib ships, uh, launch and recover our Amtraks and things like that. So we have gone back to the Navy and said, yeah, it's just a joint force. We need to train everybody. As soon as we get X's in all our boxes and the Navy Marine team's good to go, then open it up, okay? And then the second piece is we have learned over 239 years about what it takes to operate off amphib shipping and what it means to marinize an aircraft and what it means to do saltwater corrosion and what it means for material handling equipment and all the intricate pieces of launching and recovery. So just like I said, the JHSV is a wonderful opportunity. Could you put an Apache on a ship? Absolutely, but it's a wonderful opportunity. I don't think it's a steady state environment, okay? The steady state environment is to take a 53 or a V-22 or something that's been marinized and done all the night vision goggle ups and the deck bounces and everything and use them as the primary focus, you know? We've done it with the Army before. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be willing to do it again, but it ought not to be the first. It ought to be an opportunity, but not the force of first choice, okay? Um, here in the red and then back. Hi, good morning, sir. Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Um, you mentioned some of the fiscal challenges in the shipbuilding budget. Um, earlier this summer, the Deputy Secretary of Defense mentioned that uh, perhaps reintroducing the well deck in LHA 8 might be, uh, had to, you know, they may need to revisit that decision given budgets. Um, so I wondered, A, where that discussion is with the Marine Corps, and B, if there are any other plans for the rest of the decade that you're revisiting given the money situation? Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, there are some decisions we make that are around downrange. You can't undo it, okay? But, but I will tell you, and that was a, a perfect example 
of a suboptimal decision. But it was driven by the exigencies of the time and the fiscal environment of the time, and then all the asterisks and caveats and we, where we thought we want to go. You mean six and seven? The decision yes, I'm sorry, time. yeah. So, so the issue is, but the larger issue is for the Marine Corps, we're not interested in a single capability ship, a ship with only a flight deck, if we had a ship with only a well deck. We're interested in all five fingerprints of lift, and we're interested in ships that have a flight deck and a well deck. Now, we'll figure out what the mix would be for an LSD-like ship, an LPD-like ship, and a big deck. We'll figure out what that is. But we're interested in a splash capability and a flight capability off of every platform. Good morning, General. Uh, Jeff Ingersoll, Marine Corps Times. Uh, I understand that there was some experiments with fast teams on destroyers and some of these alternative platforms like the Matthew Perry. And I'm wondering, what's the likelihood the core of the Corps adopting these types of alternative platforms? And, and will those capabilities ex expand beyond fast teams? Uh, that's another question of both the crisis response that we have to go to and then opportunities with other platforms. Uh, we have within not only the Navy Marine team, but within the Department of Defense, something that we would call the continuum of response. And basically it's, here's the day-to-day -day steady state, here's a potential contingency, here's where the crisis builds up, here's where it peaks, here's where sustained ops would be, or here's where it all fall apart and get worse. So you try and plan capability sets at each step of that continuum of response. So to the previous two questions, we would be not providing the geographic combatant commander or the president with other options unless we took a look about capabilities on every platform. So to take a fast team, which belongs, it's a Navy, it's a Marine team, but belongs to the Naval component commander, and it's out there to respond. And we have used them for security force in Sana'a, security force in Libya, and other places. So how you could introduce that FAST team before a MU got there, uh, or how they could do security force is a critical component. And maybe the FAST team doesn't have a 53 or V20, uh, they have limited numbers of 53s and V22s to get them in. And maybe one of the options is the FAST group to, to, to get them in. So we'll, we're gonna look at those capabilities. And we would look to see what platforms are available. Uh, a, not the optimal one, but an LCS, a JHSV, so we're gonna take a look at all that until we figure out what is the capability and capacity of that individual platform. And because we have so many new platforms, both aviation and sh uh, sh uh, ship come out, we're still testing all of them. So uh, did we do it? Absolutely. Could we use it? This is what we're trying to establish. And if we could use it under what threat scenario, under what range ring, for how big a force and for how long to stay on the ground. Because the minute you put a Marine in there, then you have automatically given yourself the challenge of how can I talk to that Marine? How can I resupply that Marine? What Marine, what risk is that Marine at? Who is he working for? And then how do I either get into reinforcing him or get him back out? So we look at all of that. Nice. Other questions? Um, let me ask if I could about um, special pur purpose MAGTAFs and the recent establishment of the one in CENTCOM. Um, how do you see, uh, the evolution of special purpose MAGTAFs, uh, given where the the realities of the platforms you may or may not have available and uh, how you prefer to conduct operations, uh, will we see many more of them? What are some of their uh, strengths and weaknesses? Of how does it fit into the future Marine Corps? Right. So. That's a great question, and to be honest with you, I'm surprised it wasn't the first question coming out, given what's been going on. Uh, every service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, knows what their mission is, knows what they're going to do in a major theater, a war, a major, major uh, operation, but they all want to be ready and relevant to National Command Authority so that the geographic combatant commander and the president are never faced with a solution set of one. That this is all I can do because this is all I have available. So everybody's trying to be relevant. Uh, let me carry out my next point. We have a paucity of amphibious shipping, and many of us in the Marine Corps are not happy with it, okay? Now, I give you that because I'm gonna give you the second point, and for those of you who are typing frantically and work for defense journals, I would appreciate if you would <laughs> quote this correctly, okay? Because I, I used it twice before. <laughs> I love my Navy shipmates, and they have an incredible challenge with capital investments, okay? They are working very hard and very well in a really resource-constrained environment. 
I'm not happy about amphibious shipping, but we're not happy. It's not me. We're not happy as an institution, as the Marine Corps. So let me belay that last I mean, comment. Arguably, I think the Navy would say they're not happy. Yeah, absolutely, either. absolutely. And the CN, we have never had a better working relationship than we have between the Commandant and the CNO and between Headquarters Navy and Headquarters Marine Corps. And this is the fourth time I've been in the building, and I've seen it from the Joint Staff one time and from the service side three other times. I'm working in the Navy Secretariat one of those three times. So the working relationship is absolutely splendid. It's transparent. It's cooperative. It's just unfortunate that we have the best working relationship when we have the worst fiscal environment I've seen in 30 only years. only so much allowance. Absolutely, only so much allowance. So we're committed to try and do this right. Now, because we don't have either the inventory or the availability of Navy shipping, the Marines had turned around internally with the advice, no, the Navy knew what we were doing. We said we still have to provide forces because we're the nation's 911 force. We still got to provide forces to the geographic combatant commander. What else can we do to be ready and relevant to give that geographic combatant commander something he can use, he or she can use in their kit bag? And that's when we came up with a special purpose MAGTAP. So the special purpose MAGTAP is just what that nucleus says. It's a MAGTAP. It's a Marine Air Ground Task Force. And it has an aviation side, a ground side, a logistics side, a command and control side, a power projection side, and it's almost exactly like a MU, except it doesn't have Navy shipping. And that to us is a serious inability, disability, inhibition, whatever you want to call it, because we have no sovereign space from which to launch and recover. We cannot quickly move around. Uh, one of the lessons for the special purpose MAGTAF came out of a crisis response that we did last winter. And we used a precursor to the special purpose MAGTAF, but with V-22s and with KC-130s, and we were able to move our marine unit over large distances and over a 48-hour period doing some air-to-air -air refueling from several sovereign bases in both Europe and Africa to respond to a crisis. And no, I don't think anybody else could have done it. I mean, a lot of folks would have wanted to do it and had an ultimate capability to do it, U.S. or allied. But because we had the V-22s and because we had units prepositioned and because we had air-to-air -air refill, we were able to execute that mission. But it was a suboptimal mission. It would have been better to have a MU in the MED a MU and CENTCOM, and some type of AMFIB capability elsewhere, from which we could launch and recover. And then after you launched, the ships could be moving to follow and trace so you wouldn't have to recover the same distance and worry about lost aviation or air-to-air -air refueling or things like that. So the Special Purpose MAGTAF, the first one was Special Purpose MAGTAF Crisis Response, which was in the Mediterranean Basin and was available basically to Europe, UCOM and AFRICOM, a little bit to CENTCOM. And then when we realized that things were falling apart and ISIL was stepping back up, we looked at our depth to dwell capability. We looked about the build and the training and the ramp up with the V-22 capability. And we asked ourselves, the natural question is, with adequate training and not to break the availability and readiness of the aircraft, and with the right depth to dwell considerations for units that had come back from Afghanistan, could we build a second special purpose MAGTAF and make that available to the Central Command uh, and geographic combatant commander? And the answer was yes. Uh, so it's out there, and it has just deployed within the last several days. It's going to multiple locations in the Central Command AOR. It will flow in, and we'll have various missions, some of them theater security cooperation, some building partnership capacity, some exercises, and some crisis response, contingency response. And it's a great capability, and it helps the geographic combatant commander out. But it's a suboptimal capability, because we would have really liked to have it on a Navy ship. Okay. Tyler. Okay. Sitting, and then... Uh, a platform you touched on briefly, I noticed the report examines both variants of the littoral combat ship, and there's lots of speculation about, you know, as with JHSV, which is the cousin of one of the variants, how that could be used. I suspect, given your focus on your traditional amphib and its five fingers and its survivability, that's probably more of a marginal asset for you than uh, some kind of new core capability, but where does that, where those two LCSs fit and where don't they fit? If you could address that the same way you've addressed uh, JHSV. Yeah, I mean, it's to be a short answer because it's almost identical to JHSV. They're still working to uh, commission them, christen them, get them into the fleet. Then we'd have to work on them just as we did with the FAST team and capability of the JHSV. Uh, right now, I'd be less than candid to tell you, we think they have marginal capability. And it's because of the flight deck spot and it's because of the berthing uh, for the number of uh, Marines you can put on there. And it's because of the command and control capability. 
so in terms of amphibious power projection, whether it's contingency and crisis at the one end or uh, large scale at the other end, uh, potential use, but marginal use right now. Okay. I think you've worn them out. Thank you so much for coming. It's no. been great to have you here. Uh, I thank really everyone for their interest, and I thank CSIS for kind of stimulating the debate and kind of keeping our eyes over the horizon. Thank, thank you. you sir.